For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2015 Labor Day Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Sunday morning, September the 6th, 2015. Nikki Pinson is the speaker of the service teaching on Obeying the Flesh, Part 2. Well, can I tell you a little bit about myself? of what God's done in my life. Uh, I've been at the church for a little over 37 years now. Went there, it was a little wooden building, unlevel, just a, just a mess. Uh, spring wire tacked over windows that wouldn't open. Different kind of pews, nails poking up, terrier poles. Um, the bathroom was out by the back fence and it did not have water going to it. But it did have the wash spray and the lime and toilet paper, praise God. Very important, very important. You know, we actually sold that later on when we got indoor plumbing. Somebody bought that to use, praise God, for its intended purpose. I need to Anyway, we'll get off that. Uh, my parents came to visit and they said, Well, this is nice. We hope you heard and get a real church. And uh, that's what they said. And uh, But uh, God's blessed us. In fact, uh, for 35 years, I did a lot of crying over the finances. I mean, sometimes the pressure would be so heavy, I'd almost just fall to the ground. I don't know if you know what that what I'm talking about. There was a period of seven years that uh, after we built a new building, and uh, you know everything gets tested. Yes, it does. I can tell you, I went there, and after I've been there a little while, God began to deal with me, make promises to me about that church, and I cannot understand how a pastor could stay somewhere that God didn't give him a word for that place. Mm-hmm. Are you on a job or anything? I don't. I don't. And I worked uh, at a grocery store for the first nine years. It was eighteen years altogether. The Lord told me to quit, and I was afraid to quit. I mean, I had to know where that money was coming from, how much, and when. And uh, if you're self-employed, I honor you. I don't know how you do it, but and that was and so the Lord told me to quit. I wouldn't quit, and then finally I made a deal with him, and I went part time. But he wasn't happy with that. And then uh, we got bought out, and uh, eight thousand of us lost our jobs, um, and I hated that. All those people lost their job because I wouldn't obey God. <laughs> but you can believe that or not. Praise God. I mean, I'm not even going to go into all that. But God will do things to get the person. He, it's not that I'm... You know what he told me about that church? He, he told me a long time ago. He said, if I didn't obey him there, he'd remove me and put someone there that would obey. That'll keep you in your place. Praise God. And uh, he knows how to humble us. Oh my, he knows how to humble us. <clears throat> I grew up, had some misconception about misconceptions about the ministry. I thought that the purpose of a, a pastor was to see how many people he could get in that building so he could build a bigger building and see how many people he could get in that when the new building you know, just goes on. And uh, one Saturday I was out knocking doors and buying people to church and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, What are you doing? You know, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> I said, well, Lord, I'm trying to build a church. And he spoke to me and said, I said, I'll build my church. Why are you trying to? And that made a great change. Uh, we had, finally, we had a half acre. Actually, we didn't have a half acre because the people on both sides moved the fence in on it. It had been there since 19, well, they built the building in 1938. So, um well, we, we were able to buy the... I could stand here and tell you miracle after miracle. But uh, we got this other property, and we were doing well. We filled that old building, and we needed parking space. And so I got some rock knives out there on my little tractor leveling it off. And the Lord spoke to me and said, what are you doing? 
I said, and he said, what are you going to show the people tomorrow? This parking lot or something out of my word? And uh, so I made a commitment to God. I haven't always kept it. I'm sorry I haven't, but He knows all about it. And so I, I made up my mind, I was, I, and I stayed. I had a little. I fixed a little office in that old building. And I, I oh, the, the the grass need mowing, bad, you know, good, whichever. But it need mowing. And so I was in there praying and thinking about the grass, and I heard I heard a motor, a motor, a lawn. You know, I heard it out there. I said, well, what's this? I looked out and the neighbor who's a Baptist across the road over there mowing our lawn. I cannot tell you he did that every Saturday, but he did that time. Praise God. Praise God. Well, that's enough. And uh, let me say this. Uh, if you'd like to be on uh, our email list, I send out an uh, email, a little sermon message uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday. Pray from this table. A lot of you get that. And so if you want to, just put your name down where I can read it. And uh, I'll put you on our mailing list. And be glad to do that. If you don't like it, you can opt out. It hurt my feelings, but anyway. <laughs> but whatever. Oh, glory to God. Well, this is part two. Obey and lust, second part. Lord, thank you. God, speak to our hearts. Convict our hearts. Lord, we want conviction, not condemnation. And you said the Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. So God deal with it. And Lord, there's there's people in here this morning need help. They need help. Lord, we all need help. So would you help us this morning? We really want to walk with you, Lord. We want to walk with you now in righteousness and holiness and we want to walk you with you someday in white. Praise God. So bless, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you a little bit of review. Um Obey and lust. Victory always feels good, especially victory over temptation to sin. I don't know about you, but it does for me. And uh, the rewards of this victory are eternal. It's so good to you, you know you were tempted, but you didn't you didn't bite the bait this time. The biggest single cause of temptation it, to sin is lust. To lust means to have an intense desire for something, to crave or someone. To crave, hunger, covet, yearn, to long for. We had a lady there in our ministry for homeless people. And uh, the Lord's blessed us with a lot of buildings and, and some of them are large. And uh, uh, see these hands? They built buildings. But I had help. Praise God. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to say. I hate to... Shake a preacher's hand, it feels like this soft, nice, whatever. There was a friend, a friend, he helped him get a church. He needed a church, he had three kids. And uh, he felt like God called him to just a pastor. It was a very small church, and that's okay. But he'd come over and tell me how he's squirrel hunting and he's fishing and he's doing this and that. And I was working on a job. But we'd, we'd, we'd load him up when he came. I mean, load him up, you know. Dig in the freezer, whatever. Give him money. And uh, some, one day it dawned on me. Um, this ain't right. I'm working, and he's fishing. Praise God. Anyway. The, uh, later on, he lost that church. And uh, and I, there's another pastor friend that had lost his church, and he was all he had left was a travel trailer, and I let him hide it behind the church so the bank wouldn't find it. You may think I'm wrong, but that's between him and the bank. And uh, and the other the other the other uh, fellow, I found him a house. I talked some people into letting him rent the house. It was their parents. And they all they talked about was their next church and God was and they were doing the positive confession thing and they were doing all that and get a church, get a church, get a church. That's all they think about. Get a church, get a church. And it began to irritate me. And so I preached a sermon one Wednesday night on what are you gonna do if God doesn't do what you think he ought to do or what you want him to do. And they knew what I was talking about. They got very angry. But I'd like to have heard them say, I, I want a deeper walk with God. I want to know him in a greater way. I want to find this God. 
Praise God. Because ministry has to come out of your relationship with Him. Now, uh, I want to review the lust that we talk about, lust of the body. Uh, Romans 6.12 Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. The lust of the heart, Romans 1.24 Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. A lust of other things, Mark 4.19 And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Then the lust of the devil, John 8, 44, Jesus speaking, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. The lust of youth, and I went over these uh, the other time. The lust of the youth, 2 Timothy 2, 22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And then worldly lust, Titus 2, 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This present world. Various lusts. 2 Timothy 3, 6. For for of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away by various lusts. See, they already had sin, and that opens up the door for more sin. You know, uh, from righteousness to righteousness. But there is also from sin to sin. And we choose. Lust of the mind, Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation or behavior in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The lust of the flesh and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, even as others. And then deceitful us, Ephesians 4, 22, that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. And deceitful lust, I, I believe, is a very one of the most uh, dangerous. Uh, you, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing. You, what, while you're entering into the sin, uh, you're as blind as a bat. You don't, you don't think about what the consequence is going to be. You know what I'm talking about. And then when you, when you finally do it, all of a sudden you wake up, oh, why did I do that? You know, and, and why could we have seen that when we were going into the temptation? Well, it's a deceitful lust. Uh, now, I want to begin here. How lust imprisons us. James 1.14, But every man is tempted. Now, the, the verse before says, no man, uh, God does not tempt any man. He cannot be tempted with sin. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, however long that takes, brings forth death. Now, we're tempted. We are tempted. We enter into temptation when we allow ourselves to be drawn away and enticed by our own lust. We cannot blame someone else or something else because it's our own lust that we've allowed to draw us away and to entice us instead of denying those lusts or refusing to obey those lusts. And we're talking about obeying lust. Now, it is not a sin to be tempted by our lust. And as we talked about, lust is always there. Lust is inherent in us. We're born with lust. You watch those little children. You know, that lust is there. And you never reform lust. You never can cast lust out. Uh, It's there. There's actually... Before we're saved, there's only one of us. And that's the carnal man. That's full of lust. When we come to Christ and our spirit is born again, because it's been dead, dead trespasses and sin, and our spirit is born again, then we become two. There's two of us. You understand what I'm saying? There's two of us. The Scripture talks about that. There's the old man. There's the new man. And there's a conflict. And there always will be a conflict. And we have to understand this. And, and, and one reason I want to, I'm talking to you about this, we need to understand what's happening in us. Why am I failing God repeatedly? Or why did I fail Him that one big time? Whatever it is. And uh, I believe we'll be honest, there's more than one big time. But why? Or what is happening in me? And it, it goes back to the root of the lust of our flesh and of our mind, the lust of the devil, these, these various lusts, uh, youthful lusts, it goes back to that. They're operating in us. Now, we'll hang on because we'll talk about 
some things uh, concerning this. And so it is not a sin to be tempted by our lust, but it becomes a sin when we don't deny those lusts rather than obey them. Romans 6.12 You know, let me stop and say in Romans 7, uh, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I get really irritated with people. Paul was trying to do this or say this or, or lead us this way. No, he wasn't. He was hearing from the Holy Spirit and writing what he heard. Either we believe the Scripture is inspired or we don't. Either we believe Paul was it was of Paul or we believe it was of God. And by the way, in First Corinthians seven, when Paul said, Now this is me, this is not God. We have to we have to understand that. Now, uh, so Romans six twelve, let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. But we hear in that. Now once we're drawn away, we've entered into the temptation, then we're trapped, we're caught, we're made a slave, we're in prison. Look at Samson. Now, once he was drawn away and enticed, he entered into the temptation, and then he was trapped or caught. Now, the devil used a woman named Delilah to arouse his lust. And the devil knows what or who to use. He also knows when and how to arouse the lust of our flesh. Now, some would say, well, what in the world is wrong with Samson? Don't you know? I mean, she's, you tell her what your secrets are, what you're lying to her. And so she has those men come in. She, I don't know if she's drugging him or what, but he's asleep. And they do this. They put the bean to his hair. They, you know, they tie him with these new robes. They do all this kind of thing. And, and so, and she says, Samson, the Philistines be upon you. And she, he wakes up and shakes it all off. Wouldn't you think after the first second time you'd figure that out? <laughs> Wouldn't you think that Jehoshaphat, when he's going to go to battle, he, he, he marches himself up there to Ahab. Ahab doesn't come down there. He goes up there. I mean, he's just he's stupid. He goes up there. And, and so the man of God comes. I mean, you know, Ahab has his 400 false prophets. And, and, and so... Uh, to impress Jehoshaphat, but it doesn't work with Jehoshaphat. Thank God he's got some sense there, and he says, "Well, don't you have a real problem around here?" He says, "Well, I, there is one, but he hates me. He hates me. He, just, he never says anything good about me. Well, wonder why? You know, he never says anything good." He said, "We're not going to battle till you get him." So they go and get him, Micah, and they're bringing him. Some pronounce it Micah or Micah, and they're bringing him in the in. in the king's officer said, Now you say the same thing they said. So he comes, he's obedient, he does it. And then Ahab says, Didn't I tell you not to lie to me? And look at, look at, look at Ahab. He knows his 400 are lying. And he knows this man over here, he is not telling the truth because he's agreeing with them. And so he says, Well, I saw the, the Israel as sheep having no shepherd out there that had no shepherd. Meaning you're going to die, buddy, if you go out there. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to lock you up and feed you bread and water till I come back. And that man of God said, if you come back, I'm no prophet at all. And then Ahab tells Jehoshaphat, said, you wear your kingly robes, your crown, you put all that on, but I'm going to disguise myself. Wouldn't you think that, that Jehoshaphat would see a red flag on that one? But he doesn't. Wouldn't you think Samson sees something here? But why doesn't? Because he's caught. Because he can't help himself, so to speak. He's entered into the thing. It's similar to when, you know, uh, up to a point, Judas had a choice. He could have made a choice. But then they're sitting there at that last supper, and, and the devil enters that man, and he has no choice. Be careful. You think, I can handle this. Well, make it to a point you can. But once you enter in, you're trapped. And some are sitting here this morning, and you're trapped. And you know how to get out. You know you shouldn't be doing that. And it grieves you. You hate it. You hate yourself. And you've even thought about killing yourself to stop it. Don't do that. Now the devil used a woman named Delilah. Now one thing though Samson could have and should have done, no, could have, should have, would have, uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Samson, get out of her house. Run for your life. Do like Joseph. Run. 
but he's caught. Now, Delilah was a Philistine woman. Samson was a Hebrew. How much more unequally yoked together could you be? They're mortal enemies. Samson was a believer. Delilah was an unbeliever. Worship false gods. Samson had light. Delilah was in darkness. How could they have communion? They didn't have communion. It was all one-sided due to the lust of, of Samson, his flesh. You know, praise God. You ever seen a one-sided relationship, a man and a woman, and uh, one of them loves the other and the other one is whatever. Whatever they can get out of you. Now, why didn't Samson come out from among that Philistine woman? It was because he was drawn away. He was enticed to the point there was for him no turning back, no turning around, for he was trapped, he was caught, he was imprisoned by his own lust. Samson had made perfect or, or made peace, not perfect peace, he had made peace with his flesh and his affections and lusts. That's one of the most dangerous places to come to is when we make peace with our sin or our lust. See, and when we come to that point, we quit confessing our sin. And we begin to excuse our sin. We make peace with it. Well, God made me this way. What is it they're trying to, they're trying to prove that a homosexual, that he was made that way? See? But no, everyone has a choice. And I'm, I, I, some of you might agree with what I'm fixing to say, but everyone I'm saying here has the possibility of being gay, lesbian, homosexual, adulterer, adulteress, whatever you want. Don't, don't you put a... No, we, we could have been any of them. We could have been a thief. We could have been any of that. And never look down your long nose at someone that's trapped in that. But for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. Amen. Now, how to get free when you're in prison? John 8, 32. You know this is quoted a lot. Especially here. And you shall know the truth. Now, he prefaces that with this. If you stay in the Word. Okay. Stay in my Word. Which means keep it. But And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the term know, know, K-N-O-W, which Jesus uses here means to, to experience or to be intimate with. In other words, Adam knew Eve. Are you, you understand why I'm saying Adam knew Eve? It's a very intimate relationship. You shall intimately, this is an intimate thing with truth. Okay? Many know the truth, but very few know the truth. The truth is not facts. But the truth is a person. And you know who he is. It's Jesus Christ, the living Son of God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and so when Jesus says, and you shall know the truth, he's saying, you shall know me. Intimately know me. And I, the truth, shall make you free. Experiencing, beholding, and being intimate with Christ will make us or cause us to be free. I know that so. If you're a casual church goer, or if you're really even involved in religious traditions, and this is, oh my, even in the deliverance ministry, there can be tradition. I get really tired of independent people who have independent churches or go to independent churches. We're independent. We don't belong to any denomination. Well, your own, your, your own denomination, excuse me. That's all that is. And so here, how are we made free? How? But we all with unveiled, this is in 2 Corinthians 3, I think. We all with unveiled, that means unrestricted, are open uh, heaven. What if, what if we, we're to pray for an open heaven. We all with unveiled face are an open heaven. In other words, revelation is coming to us out of heaven. It's open to us. Very few people with that. Very few people. Pray for it. With unveiled face, beholding, as it, that means looking at sin, as in a mirror, the glory. Now the word glory there means a full expression, full revelation of the Lord. I'm looking at the Lord and there's no restriction. I have an open heaven to see Him. He has been revealed in me. There are two levels of revelation. There is a revelation too where He is revealed to us. Dreams, visions, preaching, teaching, reading, whatever, revealed to us. That does not change us. You hear me? That outward revelations do not change us. But then there is another level of the inward revelation of Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, 
Paul said, It pleased the Father who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal His Son in me. In me. You've got to get that. In me. There's got to be a revelation of Christ in you. By the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, as we behold Him, He's being revealed in us. That will change you. Listen. Being changed, as we behold Him, we are being changed or transformed or made into the same image. What is that? The image of Christ. From glory to glory, that's revelation to revelation. It doesn't come all in one day. Even it's by the Spirit of the Lord. Oh, praise God. And what did Jesus say in, in, in John 14, 15, and 16? He shall teach you all things. He shall guide you in, uh, into the truth. He'll take a mind and show it to you. Oh, praise God. He's going, he'll show you things to come. But it's inward because in, in chapter 14, Jesus said, He's with you, but He shall be in you. And, and so I, would, I, I know we have to say this. Most people sitting on a church pew, have, He's with them, but He's not in them. He has to be in us. And after that, there's another level of him of us being in Him. Now listen to this. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Sure, we can all claim that. I'm in Christ, you know. A lot of us say this, I'm hiding behind Him. And, and you know, and so God's looking, but He only sees His Son. He can't see me back there doing my dirty stuff. You know, I'm hiding behind the cross, all this kind of identification. You're identifying with Well, that's wonderful. I identify with a chicken, but it doesn't mean I'm a chicken. I just identify. You've got, we've got to have Him in us. By the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or whatever term you want to give it. But when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, and we stay full of the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost is showing Christ to us, and He's showing Christ in us, inwardly He's showing to us. Praise God. That is what will change us. That is the only thing that will change you. I'll tell you, you can sit on a church pew 40 years and hear 10,000 sermons and not be changed. It has to be happening in here. You can come to every deliverance camp you want to. You can seek out every... We, we have a Tuesday night deliverance service and there's this uh, man and his son came and... Uh, Oh my, they had problems. They had real problems. Their biggest problem was they cried that the whole cross was not in them by the Holy Spirit. That's the biggest problem. And you, and you can't change, I can't change that, and you can't change that. There's a lot there, we won't go with that. But Now verse 34, now remember he said, and the truth shall make you free. This is not you struggling, or me struggling about anything. But the Holy Spirit is going to make us free. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Now by obeying our lust, we become a slave. We're caught. We're in prison. We become a servant. Did you know that? You told that lie that just you made you a servant to sin. Or whatever. You used to have a real problem with lying. I tell this. I was pastor. Did you know pastors can lie? I was pastor. And uh, my dad had given me an old craftsman ratchet. You guys know what I'm talking about. And it has a lifetime warranty, right? And it, but it was broke. And he got it from somewhere. So, oh my God. I was driving 40 miles to work. I was pastoring Keller Mills and driving to Dallas. And uh, so this Sears there, and one day I took that with me. I had this bright idea, and I went by the Sears store, and I said, I want a new ratchet. And that's okay, I guess. But they said, well, when did you buy it? I didn't know they was going to ask me that. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't remember. Well, they gave me another one. They're supposed to. I took that thing home and hated it. I hated it. That's awful. It's like, it like I was aching and I had something hidden in my tent. I had to take that thing back, walk in there with it in my grubby little hand, and, so, and I had to tell them, Lord told me, I had to tell them, I had to tell them I lied. I did not buy this thing. 
That woman looked at me like I was crazy and told me, please leave and take it with me. I don't know what I did, but I didn't keep it. I did not keep that thing. Well, praise God. Anyway, I was a servant of lying for a long time. I, oh, I'd lie when the truth would work better. But I learned to do that when I was a child. Now, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So we know who the truth is, right? We know who he's talking about in verse 32 in verse 36 when he says the truth. He's talking about himself. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so, wouldn't it be wonderful to be free from the bondage, of the imprisonment of our lust? In Romans 7, 24, it says, O wretched man that I am, not lust, but that I am. Because some try to say that he was talking about before he was converted. But he said, O wretched man that I am. He talks about that whole chapter 7. When I want to do good, I don't do good. When I do what I don't want to do, what I want to do, I can't do. And you know what he said? He said, I find a law in myself. A law in myself. The law of sin is in me. That's why I'm telling you this morning, there's two of you. And there's that law in there. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Now, I was, uh, how many of you have ever heard of Leonard Ravenhill? Or you read some of his books? Heard some of his sermons? I went one time to uh, Lindale at Calvary Commission. And uh, he was speaking there. He was, uh, he was in his 90s then. Very quiet. Kind of frail, but not too much. I heard him another time at a church in Tyler. And uh, he's up there, barely raises his voice. And while he's speaking, he would, I don't know if he, he's speaking, people are running to the altar, crying out, trying to get right with God, and they're having to quiet them down so they can hear that man. And uh, so he was speaking, and when, when he got through, it was over uh, by a fireplace in that, in that building. There was a young man over there, and I'll never forget, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, from the out of his way in here. This weeping and crying. Oh, wretched man that I am. And I believe Paul was like that when he, that's what he felt when he was saying this. Do you feel wretched this morning? Maybe not right now, but the, remember the last time you fell? Did you feel wretched? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who, not what, but who shall deliver me from this, the body of this death or the sin, which is the uh, death, which is the product of sin? Who shall deliver me from this? That is the question this morning. Who is going to get out, us out of this imprisonment to our flesh? Who? Who? Not what? Who? Not what 12-step program. But who is going to? And then verse 25, he answers itself. I thank God. I thank God. It is through Jesus Christ our Lord. How does Jesus deliver us from this body of death? How can He make us free? As we behold Him, the power is in the revelation. As we behold Him, we're changed in the same image. Now you have a choice. As the Holy Spirit is showing Christ to you, you can do the revelation of... You can, you're can. you faced with this choice. I can obey the revelation of Christ, the image of Christ, or I cannot obey it. And it's still you and I making a choice. But He'll make you free if you'll choose to be like Him. You know what? I, 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 there are things I don't want to do. Not because I don't want to be embarrassed or I don't want to get fired from the church or I don't want to go to prison. But I don't want to hurt Him. I don't want to lose His presence. I, I, I want His presence. I want His presence all the time. I don't want to lose it. And, and, and there are people that compartmentalize their lives. they got their Sunday morning that's for God and the rest of the week is for them. And they do what they want to. No, you can't. Now, we've looked at the different kinds of lusts we had mentioned. And uh, it might not be a complete list of the kinds of lusts, but most of the others will fall under one of these categories of lust. Uh, the important thing is to be able to recognize our lust. Be honest about it. You've got a problem there. Be honest about it. Pornography or, or alcohol or drugs or 
attitudes or anger or unforgiveness. You know, we there's so many of those things been talked about so wonderfully in this camp. And you've got you've got a problem there. Recognize it. Confess it that you do. You know, I, I used to say, Oh God, if you'll forgive me, I'll never do it again. Well that's just don't do that. It's not long you're doing it. And and you finally you realize you can't make you'll either you'll either give up or you quit making deals with the Lord. And finally you'll say, Lord, I can't stop this myself. God, I can't overcome this by myself. Lord, I don't know if I'll do it again or not. I don't want to do it, but would you forgive me, please? Praise God. Righteousness. How do you get righteousness? By faith we hope for righteousness. By faith we hope for it. As I I mentioned the other day, by faith we hope for it. Just like you hope for everything else we're hoping for. Now, uh, by God's help we'll overcome them, gain victory over them because our soul and the souls of others we have influence over are at stake. All of mankind, all ages of mankind have lust. Uh, the fact that lust dwells within us, the Scripture says it dwells within us, that's not a sin. The sin is when we fall into lusting, similar to entering into temptations. The mixed multitude fell into lusting. And now, Matthew 26, 41, Jesus tells us, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is watch and pray. I want to tell you, most people, they want to get in a prayer line somewhere and somebody take it out of them. Pray over them, it's gone. Well, I'm not saying it's not possible. But I'll tell you for the most part, it's going to be a, it's going to be a working out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's going to be between you and God. It's going, to, it's going to be you learning Him. Look, if the only time you think about God is when you've done something wrong or on Sunday morning, you're not going to get there. You're not going to make. You're not going to overcome. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's the truth. Uh, me or you, any of us, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, being tempted is not a sin, but entering into or going through the door into temptation, or becoming overcome by temptation, certainly is a sin. If most of us know, we know when we've entered in. We know. We know we, we begin, we've got, we're going down that road. We know that. Uh, again, James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Not, not your mama's lust. Not your daddy's lust. Your lust. And then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. I mean, you're pregnant with sin. 2 Peter 2.18, For when they speak great... Swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness at sexual passions and immorality. Those who were clean escaped from them who live in error. You were escaped from it, but then you're lured back in. Now I want to give you four keys to overcoming our lust. The first key is to deny our lust. Jesus said that. Deny yourselves. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Your cross is not your mother-in-law. Okay? He's saying you die to yourself. Like I'm going to die. You die to yourself. Now, the first key is to deny our lust or reckon ourselves dead indeed unto our lust. That's scripture. The second key, this, I don't, you might rearrange these some way, but the second key is to walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Turn away from fleshly things toward the things of God. I don't know why I can't overcome my lust. But you're sitting there watching this stuff. And you wonder why you can't overcome it. Set no evil thing before your eyes. That's Scripture. Make no provision for your flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If, don't go home the same way. If there's a beer store over there, you're stopping by. You, I'm not going to today. I'm not going to today. And the car just goes over there. <laughs> Find you another route. <laughs> go home some other way. <laughs> Don't be hiding some back in the barn somewhere. You know, uh, this is well, I, when I get off work, I go home. Uh, we we live about 12 miles from town. I get off work, I go by this little convenience store and get me a bag of popcorn and a coke every day. 
I couldn't make it home without my bag of popcorn and a Coke. And the Lord said, What's, Hey, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> you just don't know how hard it was to break that popcorn Coke thing, addiction. But, but God helped me and I did. You know what? I never have drank in my life, and I'm not. I thank God. I thank God. When I was a when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in Dallas. They didn't have. I didn't know what a school bus was. Never saw one in my life. And you just got to school. You know, three miles up uphill both ways. <laughs> you just got to school. Three, three, three foot of snow, whatever. <laughs> just talking about that. But I, I so uh, I'd walk home and there'd be a bottle of beer hadn't even been opened. Or there'd be a pack of cigarettes and, and right there. Or there'd be a pornography, a book right there. Back then, though, they weren't as good as they are now or whatever, good, bad, whichever way it is. But they weren't. And uh, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if the devil just snuck up there right before I got there and put it there or what. But uh, we can, you know, praise God. You know, God really cares. He really cares. He doesn't want you in prison. He doesn't want... You're, you're grieving over it. You're, you're desperate. Just because we can go around and look normal. You know you see on TV this mass murder and they've got him on TV and he looks just like everybody else. And we can look like everybody else, but we got things raging inside of us. You can be a grandma and have stuff. A little old sweet grandma with 15 grandkids and all of us sitting in your lap and full of it. Just absolutely full of it. Lust. Some people, they're full of lust, they just don't have any way to fulfill it. See? That's all it is. Set no evil thing before your eyes. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Come out from among unbelievers. Don't touch their stuff. Forget those things that are behind. Press on toward the likeness of Christ. The, the, the prize of the high calling in Christ. It's the image of Christ. A star of your flesh and feed your spirit. Little boy, I heard Brother Clinton didn't tell this, B.H. Clinton, a little boy had two puppies, one white and one's black. And, and this man asked, which one can whip the other? And he said, the one I feed the most. The one I feed the most. Feed your flesh, you're going to have trouble with it. Feed your spirit, you'll overcome that thing. Praise God. Starve, starve your flesh. The third key is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Stay full of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I don't know how anybody thinks that they can live an overcoming life that they're, if they're not full of the Holy Spirit. How in the world can you? The fourth key, I just know myself. And I'm going to say this, speaking in tongues, you build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude 20. And he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself or builds himself up. You know, you go out, how many of you take a shower? Why do you take a shower? Why do you speak in tongues? Same reason. Clean that, clean that spirit, clean that soul in there. Take as good a care of what's inside of you, what is what is outside of you. The fourth key to avoiding inner temptations is to watch and pray, so that our own lust does not draw us away and entice us. But but what do you think watching and praying is? To watch means to be on the alert against any sudden surprise or trap of temptation which attempts to catch us off guard. This is a spiritual watching that Jesus was warning his disciples about. It wasn't a you know a security thing as far he was about to be arrested. And he wasn't telling them, watch out for those soldiers, they're coming. He said, oh, you watch the spiritual watch, praise God. Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes, but in vain. Now to pray is to keep in constant touch with God. That's what he's meaning. So that when we find ourselves confronted with a temptation, and, and, uh, and it's not if we will, it's when, that even though our spirit is... But we can, you know, you can, you can greatly diminish the, the, the times of temptation by starving your flesh. You can greatly, you can help God... Help him, praise God. Help the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, even though our spirit is determined not to, uh, is determined to avoid sin, the temptation will not prove too strong for the weakness of our flesh with its affections and lusts. Everybody say this with me. My flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. You believe that? That's true. Now, praying is more than begging God to keep us from sinning. It also includes giving thanks. You can 
Read that uh, there. Giving thanks, singing spiritual songs, praying in the Holy Ghost or in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now I want to talk to you about condemnation. Nakedness. Condemnation is a very cruel and hard taskmaster. Condemnation rules us of our faith, our peace, our confidence concerning our standing with the Lord. And that's why when you tell when you tell God you'll never do it again, you just and then you do it again, you just heap in more condemnation on yourself. It's difficult to have faith to ask for things in prayer when we're living under a load of condemnation. It's difficult to allow ourselves to be useful to God in His mighty and righteous kingdom when we're plagued with condemnation. However, I know some that do a lot of things they shouldn't be doing, but they just, they just go right on preaching, teaching, whatever, singing. Uh, there's no brokenness there. You know, we're not going anywhere with God unless we have a broken and contrite spirit. Absolutely go nowhere. Read Psalm 51. And, and I've seen so many with their heads down in church when the presence of the Lord comes in. I mean, their heads are down. Are they going to the bathroom wearing the doors out uh, on their cell phone or clipping their fingernails? That's what you did before you had the cell phone. And uh, they're, they're doing all this stuff. You watch it. I see it. I'm standing up here and I'm watching you. And, and, and when you're... Uh, praise God. And, and, and when the Spirit of God begins to move, they're out of there. Or, or, or there's a convicting word being preached. they got their head down. But they have to be there because Mama made them come or the wife made them come or something, you know. It's, a, it's really a sad thing. Uh, because of why? A great load of condemnation. I, I, I know what this I've been praying for people and I put my hand on their head and the devil said, I know where your hand's been. He'll tell you all kinds of stuff. Come on now. Don't look at me like that. You know it's true yourself. Uh, he's a talker. The devil's a talker. It's difficult to have faith when you've got this condemnation. Being tormented by it. Condemnation is not from God or of God. It's a natural byproduct of disobeying God in this word, which is sin. John 3.17 For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. If you are right now burdened down with condemnation, it's not coming from God. Oh, it's hard. Sometimes we've got to be really good actors. You know, with this heavy load of condemnation, we're acting like nothing wrong with me. But just such a heavy load of condemnation in there. Hmm. Now, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin, from continuing to commit sin, and from the consequences of sin, including the condemnation that sin produces. Philippians 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count or consider not myself to have apprehended this Apostle Paul speaking. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How long does it take for you to be forgiven when you confess your sin? That's right then. But how long does it take to come out from under that dark cloud of condemnation? And but we should be that way. And I'm not. I'm not telling you. I'm not condoning sin. I'm not saying go out and sin and then confess and ha ha ha. You know, everything's wonderful. And I'm just not. No. But condemnation is a powerful tool of the devil. If you really repented of that, if you confessed it, there should be no condemnation unless you're allowing it. Um, praise God. Uh, there's such a danger in even saying that, though. I'm telling you, it's a danger in it. Because some people take that as a license to go ahead and do what they want to and then just confess it and go on happy about your way. Are you hearing that? I, I'm, the Holy Spirit will convict. If there's no conviction there, there's something. There's something wrong. But conviction, you, you deal with it and you're forgiven, you forgive yourself, and you go on. Now, the Apostle Paul here, he's, 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 he confesses he's not there yet, but he's moving in the direction of apprehending the likeness of Christ. The mark of the prize of high calling of God is the likeness of Christ produced in the believer. The definition of being saved is to, listen, is to obtain the likeness of Christ inwardly. Whatever you think it is, are you saved? Oh yeah, I walked out, shook the preacher's hand, whispered that prayer, repeated, you know, I profess Christ. No. 
Salvation is that you're being transformed, conformed, you're growing up into Christ in all things, to the full measure of Christ. This is an ongoing process, and that's what it means to be saved. If that's not happening in you, you're not saved, I'm not saved. It is to become like Christ. If we tell people that instead of all this other stuff we say, if tell them the truth, do you want to be like Christ? Do you want Christ for me? Do you want to die to yourself? Do you want to lose yourself? Jesus said you have to lose your life to gain it. Tell them that. Tell them what it's going to cost them. There is a real problem in all of us. We do not want to let go of our will. We don't want to let go of anything about ourselves. Our reputation, our fun, our pleasure, our money. Our positions, the rich young ruler had a problem with that. See, Jesus told him what it took. He said, sell everything you've got. It's a problem. Give up your job and come and follow me. And he walked away sorrowful because he wasn't willing to do it. Tell people the truth. Don't tell them, oh, you get saved, everything's going to be wonderful. No, it's not going to be wonderful. You've got a bullseye on your head then. Tell them the truth, praise God. Uh, the definition of being saved is to obtain the likeness of Christ inwardly. It's not a free ticket to heaven or insurance against the fire of hell. If we're not growing up to Christ in all things, then we're not saved no matter what someone told us. The Lord's intention is to move us away from our past failures toward the likeness of Christ. Righteousness is obedience to the likeness of Christ. That's all it is. To have Christ formed in us, to grow up to Christ in all things, to be changed in the same image. These are all Scripture. The same image or the likeness of Christ. It's a process. It continues till we leave this earth. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But we are of Him, of God, in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. How is Christ made unto us righteousness? How? As we behold Him, we're changed in the same image. That's how He's made unto us as righteousness. Not identifying with Him, not behind behind Him, but being changed to be as He is. It's really, it's, I was telling you earlier, um, the, first step, the first step is Christ uh, with you, then in you, listen to this, and then you are in Him. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Now, here's the test to know whether we are in Him or not. Are we a new creature? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. But are old things passed away? If we're in Him, that, that, is, that is what's happening in our lives. If any man be in Christ. See, Christ in us, He's in my house. Okay, somebody's in your house who's the boss. But if we're in Christ, we're in His house, who's the boss? It's another step, but I, I believe this is where I'm at right now. The final ultimate is oneness with Him. In John 17, His high priestly prayer, Jesus so passionately prayed that we'd become one with Him, like as He was one with His Father. We have to become with, one with Him. We think like He thinks. We talk like He talks. We walk like He walks. We see what He sees. Hear what He... We, we're one with Him. That's salvation, folks. Praise God. Now, all that, all that a pure heart after God desires is to be bound up in this, the wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption found only in Jesus. Our attempts at self-works of righteousness will never produce the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness is produced in us only as Christ is formed in us. Um, we're either an establisher or a submitter. He said, uh, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, this, the, apostle, the apostle Paul's talking about the Jews there, <clears throat> excuse me, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, we go about to establish our own righteousness, not submitting unto the righteousness of God. So you're an establisher or you're a submitter. We all are. This is God's answer. I'm sorry I use the word you so much, but I mean me too. You understand that. This is God's answer to the condemnation that follows sin. The absence of condemnation is a byproduct of obedience to the voice of God or being led by the Holy Spirit. Oh, praise God. You know, in, in, in Luke chapter 4, you find the description of Christ. It says He was full of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit. And He went in the power of the Spirit. Now, 
being led by the Holy Spirit and to the written Word of God, which also was only given by the Holy Spirit and is understood only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after or according or in obedience to the flesh, but after or according to or in obedience to the Spirit. Now, if you're, if you're reading out a modern translation, half that verse is missing, you know that. Okay? Somebody, I guess when it's printed, it just didn't print. But uh, you know that. If you have a non-inspired version, it won't be there. You know what I mean? It is. And in fact, if you look in, in Mark chapter 16, you're missing almost half the chapter. What does it mean to walk after? What does it mean to walk after according to or in obedience to the Spirit? It means to obey the image of Christ as the Holy Spirit is revealing Him to you. Jesus said He'll take the things of mine and show them to you. Take the, he, what else do we think He's doing? Oh, He gives me goosebumps. He is revealing Christ in us. That's His job. That's, what he's, that's why Jesus said, I must go away. If I don't go away, the Comforter won't come. Galatians 1, 15 and 16, I already gave you that one uh, to reveal His Son in me. If we conform to or obey the image of Christ, which the, which the Holy Spirit reveals in us, but not our idea of Christ. You know, uh, what would this bracelet, what would Jesus do? Well, we don't know what He We don't even know how to pray as we ought. We don't even know how to pray as we ought. So we're going to know how to be like Christ? No, we're not. The Imitation of Christ. That was a very famous book. Imitation, imitating Christ. You can't imitate Christ. I just want to do what Jesus would do. Well, that's good if the Holy Spirit is showing you what Jesus is and what He's doing. Uh, Jesus said, I never say a word I don't hear my Father say. I never do anything I don't see Him doing. Now, But if we refuse to obey, then condemnation is our lot. Of course, there's the option of attempting to do what the world does and drown oneself in drugs, beer, entertainment, food, obsession with sex, uh, to temporarily ease the effects of condemnation. You and I do not have to live under the heavy weight of condemnation as long as we're allowing Jesus Christ to live His life in us and through us. Now, Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Many years ago, I, I, God had me preaching on that for a series on that one verse. And I'm going to tell you, the longer I preach it, the smaller the crowd was. <laughs> That's the truth. People are very willing to be a Christian and all the good th- have all the good things it's offered as long as they don't have to submit. As long as they don't have to deny themselves. You know, they're, they're willing, oh, come get this good stuff here, you know. Uh, John 8, 10. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now you can view that, go and sin no more, as a commandment, or you can also, this is the way the Lord revealed to me, that's a prophetic word. And go and sin no more. And go and sin no more. It ain't going to happen anymore, sister. Prophetic word. Oh, God, you know that? I, I, I need to say that. You want to overcome? Let God give you a word. Oh, let Him give you a word and live in that word and obey that word and, and follow that word. As someone was saying, you know, write it down. Write it down, praise the Lord, on the index card. To experience condemnation means to have strong, a strong sense of guilt, even to the point of hopelessness. If there ever was someone who, had, who could rightfully condemn another, it was Jesus. He had a right to condemn her. And if there ever was a person worthy of condemnation, it was this woman caught in the very act of adultery. But Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Paul, you can find about as much condemnation, probably more in the church than you can anywhere. I mean, condemners. In the church, you know. Uh, Now, the Scripture describes condemnation as similar to the shame of nakedness. In Genesis 2.25, it says, Adam and Eve were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. 
Why weren't they ashamed? Because they hadn't sinned. They hadn't sinned. They had disobeyed God. Sin had entered the world, and no part of the human body had been put to any sinful use. There was no shame. Adam and Eve were not ashamed. Nothing in them or on them or about them caused them shame. There was there was nothing sinful, defective, scandalous, or worthy of blame. No sin in their nature, no guilt on their conscience, or wickedness in the hands in their hands or their actions. Adam and Eve were not ashamed that they were naked, no more than children are ashamed to see each other naked. Or that, uh, or that we are to see them naked unless you're a pervert. You know, you, it's, this is a little child. Innocence. They were innocent. They weren't ashamed. Oh, but something happened. Now, Adam and Eve had, uh, saw no necessity or reason to cover themselves. Nor would they have ever had any if they had not sinned. If they had not sinned. Now, they did not know what shame was. It was not until they disobeyed God that they were ashamed. And that's we the shame is not there till we yield to the lust of our flesh, our mind, various lusts, the youthful lusts. It's not there till we do it. But when we do it, guess what shows up? Shame. Condemnation. Genesis three seven. If, you know, are you are you are you tired of that yet? Are you tired of the condemnation yet? Or have you learned how to deal with it through these various ways, you know? Psych ourselves up. Let somebody tell us it's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Everybody's okay. God doesn't. Come as you are. God accepts you. All inclusive. All that kind of stuff. Genesis 3, 7. The eyes of them both were open and they knew or they realized that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Here's what the disobedient sinner does. They try to cover their sins and their failures by works of their own. You know, they think it's like the, the Lady Liberty. She's got a blindfold and she's got these... If I stack up enough good things over here that outweigh my bad things, you know. But that doesn't work either. To keep the whole law and yet offend in one point. See, we're guilty of all. Praise God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. And Adam said, I heard your voice. I heard your voice. Praise God. Oh no. My battery's getting low. It's not supposed to happen. Maybe does that mean I'm long winded? Um, well, they made themselves fig leaves, sewed them together. That's what a sinner does. Uh, but here, God said, And Adam answered, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord God said, Who told you that you were naked? Who told you you were naked? That's condemnation. Who condemned you? I don't condemn you. But he said, Have you eaten of the tree wherein I commanded that you should not eat? Praise God. Are you living a life of shame and condemnation this morning? Well, repent and come into the everlasting arms of Jesus so that He can take away all your shame and all your condemnation. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, those that are still practicing practice and sin don't see the shame of their nakedness, but God sees. The sinner is not condemned, folks, okay? He's not condemned. The soul that sins, it shall die. But the sinner's already dead. It's us. that are wanting to walk with God. When we sin, there's death comes in. And condemnation comes in. Or, but it should be conviction of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The remedy, though, is don't make yourself an apron. Let the blood of Jesus cover your sin. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. He that believes on Him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Praise God. Now, restoring the, uh, those overcome by their lust. Samson was caught and overcome with the fault, but there was no one to restore him to God. No one. And therefore his lust brought forth sin or de- and death. You know, he pulled the house down on him. What does it feel like to be a child of God and to fall into sin? It feels like death, doesn't it? It feels like death. Because it is death. Adam and Eve hid his spiritual death. Condemnation is a part of that death. All of us has failed and sinned enough to fill an ocean liner with enough condemnation to sink it to the bottom of the ocean. But to the sinner there's no death, as I said. That's what they are. They're dead in trespasses and sin. We need someone to restore the fallen ones. Nathan restored David after he had given in to the lust of his flesh with Bathsheba. He did it by confronting him with a word from God. 
The father of the prodigal son restored him after the son had given into the lust of his flesh to go into a far country and to live a righteous life of sin. But the father restored him. By the way, not everyone was happy with that. Jesus restored Peter after he had given into the lust of his flesh, trying to preserve his flesh when he was questioned about his involvement with Jesus. Barnabas restored John Mark after he had given into the lust of his flesh and left the ministry to go back home to Mama. At first, Paul refused to restore John Mark, but later Paul did. And now we have the gospel according to Mark. Are you a restorer of those that have fallen? Are you? Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you with your spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. Now that's real easy as long as they didn't do it to you. Right? Or to someone close to you. Only the spiritual can restore the fallen ones. Someday you and I may be tempted. Well, the truth is we already have been. And then we might need someone to restore us. Also, restoring fallen ones could be our insurance, according to that scripture, against us being also tempted. Right? Lest you also be tempted. Have you fallen and your failure become known? Or maybe it's still secret at this time. Do you need to be restored? Do you want to be restored? It is impossible to restore those who deny their failure or blame others for their failure or who see no need to be restored or who don't even want to be restored. He said, if we have, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit says that by forgiving sins, we're faithful and just. See, we want to be like Him. What is He? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Are we going to be different when someone confesses to us? Are we going to be faithful and just to forgive them of their sins? If we say we've not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. See, if we confess that we have sinned and name them as our own, then His Word is in us. We're in agreement with His Word. If we deny that we have sinned, then His Word is not in us. We're not agreeing with His Word concerning our sin. He said we have sinned. But if we say it's not so, then someone's lied. And we made him out to be a liar. The Scripture said, Let God be true, but every man a liar. My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the perpetuation for our sins, the price paid for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If, now listen to this. If you find no human to restore you, Nobody will. Have you been there? Everybody's down on you. You said you were this. And you said, you know. But there's hope. And there's one who can and will restore you. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And it says, and He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Oh, praise God. There may be some things we can't be restored to. There may be some relationships or positions on this earth that we can never be restored to. But the important thing is that we are restored to Christ because we're complete in Him. I'm not complete in some position I used to have or relationship I used to have. There are people that won't talk to me. There's probably people who won't talk to you. You disappointed them in some way. But you know what? I just got to have it right with the Lord. I can't worry about what they do. I cannot. Praise God. Psalm 51, 12 says, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free or willing or generous spirit. When did he pray this? After, after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. He said, You're the one. You sinned. You committed murder. You committed adultery. You tried to hide it. But God knew and he said, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Would you stand with me? Praise God. Do you need the joy of your salvation restored this morning? Oh God, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's a battle, isn't it? And it never ends. But what do you want this morning? Who do you want? That's a better question. Who do you want? 
I want to say this and this is from the Lord He's offering you so much more He's offering you such a better deal why are you settling for less why are you listening to the promises that the devil makes to you instead of hearing what God's saying to you what He's offering you let me tell you you can't have it both ways you cannot we cannot have it both ways we can't live according to the lust of our flesh mind all those things and live for God at the same time he made it so plain he made it so plain if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me you can't follow yourself you can't follow the American dream. You can't follow your lust and follow Him at the same time. It's all the way with Jesus or it's no way. Quit, the Lord says quit trying to patch things up. Quit trying to patch up things. And come, the Lord said, come to me. Come clean. Make a commitment. And let me help you stick with it. Folks, things are winding up fast. Things are coming on this earth, on this nation. The Lord woke me, well, this last, this week, earlier this week. That's what He said to me. He told me I need to get serious about Him. I need to get serious about Him. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We have no idea how much God loves us. No idea. Yeah, we know He died on the cross for us. But we don't even comprehend that really. What that meant. He loves us so much. He wants to fellowship with us. But He told us. You know, He talked about there what communion has light with darkness. How can He have communion with us when we're full of darkness? But we're making the choice. We're making the choice. Don't think of the Lord as your a spare tire in your trunk in case you get in trouble. He better be our life. When Christ to his our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Is somebody in your life besides him? Is something in your life? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord of God, Lord of God. Lord, help me make the right choices. God, help me to go after you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you want prayer this morning, if you'll come and stand. With God's help, I'll come by and pray for you. If you want prayer, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.